Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have with me an old friend, Ian Gordon. He's uh, back with me. He's been several times on this show over the last several years, um, and so it's really good to have him back with uh, me. I suppose most of you are familiar with Ian. Uh, newcomers may not be, but uh, he is globally renowned uh, for as an economic forecaster. He writes uh, the Long Wave Analyst newsletter. And uh, I would tell people before we go any further that they should go to longwavegroup.com, longwavegroup.com, where you can read uh, Ian's uh, many uh, writings that he has there, many, a lot of information, not only Ian's, but he is writing very prolifically these days. Uh, now that he is, uh, well, he's not a stockbroker anymore, so I guess he has more time to read. He is a prolific reader. And uh, I think the only other person that I've ever met of any friends of mine anyway that uh, have a library as extensive as Ian Gordon's would be my friend Gene Epstein of Barron's, who's on this show from time to time. But not only does Ian read a lot, uh, he, he's a great student of history, and he pulls that history together, helps uh, to look at what's happened in the past, cause and effect, and to project it into the future, I think, as well as anybody I have met up with over the years. And uh, certainly, Ian was one of the first people... Uh, back in the late 90s, and I think it was in 1998, I think, when I first met up with Ian, uh, he was calling for the next secular bull market in gold. And boy, has he been right. We've not seen a market as bullish as this in a long time. I don't know if you can think of any other market that went up 10 straight years before taking a breather in 2013. But Ian had that figured out going back to 1998. And perhaps before that, he was starting to form his views on the market. So th- this is a, a very wise man who's been around uh, the sun quite a number of times, as have I. And it's really pleasure. It's really a pleasure to have you back with me again, Ian. Thanks for joining me. Well, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, Jay. It is always fun, I, uh, because you are intellectually stimulating, and, and so many people, uh, well, not on this show, because those are the kind of people that I go after, but uh, if you turn the mainstream media on, you may as well just, you know, uh, I don't know, may as well just close your ears, because it's going to be the same old, same old. Uh, so I have to get right to it, Ian. You know, the most one of the most spectacular calls you've made, and because you are looking at the long-term picture, the long wave, uh, you know, it's uh, timing, I wouldn't say, is necessarily uh, your greatest forte, but you certainly do take a great picture, a great, have a great view of the future over the longer term. So you, uh, a couple of years back, are suggesting before this bull market is over, we're going to see a sort of a catastrophic decline in the Dow. You, you said Dow 1000 is not a silly number. One time you wrote an article stating that. And at the same time, you think gold is going to go to $4,000 or something like that. Do you still think that? And if so, uh, give us the rationale. Well, the rationale for Dow 1000 is simply because, because my work that... Uh, Really, we're in what I call the winter stock bear market, and it's always been the worst stock bear market of the uh, long wave cycle. And it really has, effectively has to correct all the ongoing bullishness that's been in the stock market from the beginning of, uh, of the, you know, from the, the, the start of the cycle in the spring. Mm-hmm. But particularly to correct that, uh, that huge bull market that always appears in the autumn of the cycle. So, you know, you can go back and look at these autumn bull markets, and we're only in the fourth long-term cycle right now, all Kondratiev cycle. And um, the bull market started in 1982 uh, with the Dow at 777 and uh, rose to 11,750 in 2000. We've been higher than that in 2007 and of course right now we're higher than that but I still say that the 2000 peak was the uh, autumn stock bull market peak and what we've had since then is really a Federal Reserve, a paper money induced uh, stock bull market. Um, And the reason that I pick a thousand for the for my target is that it's really akin to the bear market, the previous winter bear markets, and particularly the 1929-32 winter bear market. And that, uh, the Dow lost uh, 90, about 90% of its value between uh, 1929 and 32, and the transportation index, which at that time was every bit as important as the Dow index because it had been the senior index 
uh, prior to the industrials coming to the fore, uh, that it lost 93%. And the, the other thing that we know from just basic technical analysis, areas of resistance uh, ultimately become support. And the Dow actually hit 1,000 12 times before it, it finally penetrated to the upside mm-hmm. in 1982. The initial time that it hit there was actually at the end of spring. There was a big bull market in spring. There always is. And when it hit 995 in June 1966. And thereafter, as I say, there were another 11 occasions when it got to 1,000, but could never really get through it, that mm. number until 1982. So those that resistance point ultimately becomes a support point. So that we know that the winter bear market, when it does... Uh, proceed is going to be every bit as vicious as the winter bear market of 1929-32 or even the winter bear market of uh, 1874 uh, down to about 18, uh, 1890. Uh, these bear markets basically correct almost everything that the preceding bull market has has enjoyed. And again, if you look at uh, 2021, 20, the Dow when it started the autumn bull market in 1921 was priced at 66 points mm. and rose to 381 in in October uh, in September 1929 but it corrected to 42 points in 1932 that's below the point from whence it began and our the big autumn bull market in this cycle began at 777 on the Dow so I don't think 1,000 is any way unrealistic as a number that we can expect when this winter bear market ultimately takes hold. Well, that is a shocker because uh, people are not uh, prepared for that. Even uh, Charles Nanner, uh, who is calling for the Dow to be cut in half over the next uh, the next five years or so, uh, is, is certainly not looking at anything like that. Although it was interesting, I remember when you were on with uh, Robert Prechter one time on this show, uh, you. Uh, you joked about how you were the bull because uh, Prechter was looking for something uh, considerably below a thousand on the Dow. He still is. The number that they have is uh, uh, around four hundred on the Dow. Yeah. Well, he has his own methodology, but you're being a bit more conservative. <laughs> conservative, I guess. Uh, what's the timing for this, Ian? Well, it it could be, and I just wrote a piece saying that. Um, the stock market may have peaked uh, here at the end of July. Uh, one of the things we use and I find to be very valuable as a, as a tool in indicating a turn in, in the market is what we call a key point reversal. Mm-hmm. And that is made when the uh, stock or whatever it is that you're uh, valuing makes a new high and then closes b- below the close of the previous bar. So Mm -hmm. when it does it on a monthly basis, as we saw in July, the Dow made a new high in July, an all-time high in July, but it closed below the high that it had made in June, which was uh, the highest closing price up to that point in time. Uh So that close, that reversal, is a very strong indication uh, that we've now, on the long-term basis, uh, reversed the trend, the upwards trend in the Dow. And um, also, the, I also wrote a piece that uh, I think at the same time showing that we've got a, a, a major symmetry here in the, in the stock markets. Uh, you peaked in 2000, you went down into 2002. You peaked in 2007, you went down into 2009. Mm-hmm. And now you peaked in 2014. So you have essentially two down, five up, two down, five up. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, those twos and fives are Fibonacci numbers, which are very uh, valuable sort of in terms of uh, plotting uh, market changes and so I really think that, you know, that sequence, 2, 5, 2, 5, is very good. And I, I, I said, you know, symmetry in the markets in the seven-year rich, mm-hmm. um, because we're really, we're seven years, we made a peak in 2000, another in 2007, and now we've made another in 2014. So th- those things are sort of 
further evidence that we may have already seen the peak in the, in the Dow and that uh, uh, we're now heading down. And uh, there will be no stopping it this time because the Federal Reserve basically has been the instigator of creating the, the new bullishness because every time the Dow's gone down, as it did between 2000 and 2002, uh, Greenspan dropped rates from 6 to 1% at that time and flooded the banks with money, got the market re revived in 2002 to 2007. Rates followed that move up. So we went back from 1 back to 6% in 2007. Then market uh, crashed into 2009, March 2009. And rates, of course, Bernanke brought rates down to 0%. But rates haven't followed this bullish move. So there's no... Uh, means of the Federal Reserve to effectively uh, bring down rates to try and uh, get the rejig the the stock market, and there's no means either by effectively pushing money into the banking system because they're already you know been pushing a trillion dollars a year um, into the banks, and uh, they, if they do anything like that again, uh, the dollar will basically uh, the dollar will become worthless. Well, we had uh, we were just talking to Axel Merck, who uh, who I think agrees with you longer term and the shorter term. Though he thinks that uh, uh, that we're going to see continually lower real rates of interest, and that uh, you know that the, playing the devil's advocate here, Ian. Of course, the mainstream, the people that you see every day on CNBC. I don't suppose you waste your time with that, but if you listen to the mainstream and they're talking about, well, why can't we just uh, do a helicopter drop and literally put uh, uh, trillions of dollars in the hands of common folks and let them go out and spend it, you'd certainly be able to generate economic activity that way and over, overwhelm the deflationary forces that you see. What do you say to that argument? Well, again, I mean, it's just another way of, uh, of, of destroying the dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the more dollars you create, the more you make it uh, of, of less value. So um, I just don't see that that's a... A real game. I mean, uh, what are you going to do? Put money into uh, people's banks, bank accounts. I mean, basically, um, that money in those banks' accounts is ready to be taken uh, should the banks get into trouble again. So I, I, I think that that really is not an option. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, it's a sort of a it's a panic call that people are sort of seeing that might happen. Or could happen. I don't think. It, it, I think it's impossible that something like that can happen. All right. So if we're looking at the kind of scenario you're pointing with a, a deflationary implosion, equity market starting, I guess, with the equity markets. The equity markets tank, and then what happens? You have an awful lot of defaults, margin clerks calling in loans. Uh, you have uh, an economy that grinds to a complete halt or something close to that. And then you have, um, then then you should have prices that are falling. How do you get to four thousand dollar gold in that kind of environment? Well, it's really the same scenario as following nineteen twenty nine. Of course, the gold price was fixed at that time, uh, but the run to gold after the uh, after nineteen twenty nine and the stock market crash and so on was uh, was massive. Everybody wanted gold, particularly as the U.S. banking system was collapsing at that time. Between 1929 and 1933, 10,000 U.S. banks failed. And um, so everybody was uh, essentially trying to uh, get gold. Uh, it wasn't only Americans who could legally do it by, you know, going to the bank with a $20 bill and getting a, a $20 gold piece, whether it was a Liberty or St. Gordon's $20 gold piece. Um, and people were, you know, hoarding gold like crazy because the, the whole system was effectively collapsing. The economy was collapsing, and that was bringing the banks down. The banks, banks had lent out money everywhere, uh, not only to the American people, but uh, also uh, to different countries around the world, uh, lots to Austria and China, uh, sorry, to Austria and Germany. And, of course, that money couldn't, couldn't come back. And uh, so, you know, the banks, the U.S. banks were collapsing, and everyone was so scared 
they went to gold. And it wasn't only gold that really benefited from this, even though the price was fixed initially at that $20.67 and then raised by Roosevelt to uh, $35 in January 1934. But the gold companies themselves, there was a massive move to gold, uh, to the gold companies. And what remained of capital flowed almost exclusively to gold in the 1930s. Here in Canada, there were ten. Uh, sorry, there were a hundred new gold mines put into operation between 1929 and 1930, and wow. Canadian gold production increased by two and a half times between wow. that time. So you could see that there was a and worldwide production uh, doubled between 1929 mm-hmm. and 1940. So everything was moving to gold because everything elsewhere was collapsing. Mm-hmm. You know, Ian, this really, uh, this really is in, in sync with Bob Hoy's view that, uh, you know, he, he believes this is the sixth major credit contraction in the last 300 years. He goes that South Sea bubble and various other things, the 1929-30 uh, event and so forth. But he's made the point that for a period of 15 to 20 years, the, with the real price of gold rising, it has uh, really done exactly what you said happened in the 1930s. A tremendous amount of capital that goes in uh, to seeking real honest money, money that can be trusted. Uh, and uh, so I guess that's what you're seeing. That's what you're saying we're going to see. We've seen, a, we've had a couple of pretty tough years here, though, in the gold sector, Ian. Uh, do you think we're coming out of it now? It seems to me like we may be bottoming, uh, the gold price may be bottoming now. Is that, is that your read of it? Well, Jay. Uh, whenever gold uh, starts to sort of percolate and uh, against paper money, mm-hmm. governments always wage war on gold. Mm-hmm. And uh, w- they've been doing that. You could say that the, the war on gold has started when Roosevelt confiscated gold and and uh, made it illegal for Americans to uh, made it illegal for Americans to even own gold. And right. That was in 1933, and then you know when we the price the dollar was fixed to gold at 35 dollars, and by the way that wasn't a real gold standard because only countries could exchange their dollars right uh, for American gold. Americans themselves still couldn't uh, uh, own gold. Um, when 35 dollars, when countries decided that the Americans were printing too many dollars to uh, principally fight uh, the Vietnam War, they they started to exchange their dollars for U.S. gold, and so uh, at that time the United States inveigled six other countries to set up the London Gold Pool, which was to mm-hmm. effectively sell gold to keep the price at thirty-five dollars, and that lasted for six years. But even that was a failure. And eventually gold broke out of that $35. The London gold pool collapsed. Uh, France left it first. Uh, but the whole thing collapsed. And America, the United States was 50% of that, that pool. So America was 50, selling 50%. And the other countries were selling the other 50% to try and hold it at 35 So you've had these wars. And then you had the, the war on gold when Gordon Brown sold almost half the British gold holdings in uh, the late 1990s to try and hold the price down. So these wars are ongoing, and we've seen obvious takes on takedowns on gold in the COMEX. I mean, anybody who doesn't see that has to be blind when you get a massive sell of gold that hits the market all at once. So uh, these wars are trying to sort of in, in convince people that the paper currency is every bit as good as gold. Well, I think that that war is coming to an end. I think the wherewithal to to wage that war is coming to an end. And gold hereafter, and I think we're almost, we're beginning, we're starting to see that gold is beginning to uh, shine again. Um, then gold will really start to take off. I, I'm, I'm a true believer that eventually you will not be able to get gold at any price, the physical gold at any price. And if that's the case, that will make these gold companies extremely valuable, the companies that are producing gold. 
-hmm. And the reason I say I don't believe you'll be able to get it at any price is because the run to it will be so huge and countries themselves will be uh, trying to fill their coffers with gold because they know that ultimately the whole fiat paper money system, worldwide paper money system, has to collapse. And uh, gold, I think, will become the mainstay of a, a new international uh, monetary system that evolves. Ian, we've got only about three minutes left. I've got to ask you in terms of the this evolution to back to a gold-backed currency or so uh, because people will just lose confidence in fiat. Uh, the developments are pretty striking, and I think what's taking place with the BRIC countries right now. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on the BRICs? I mean, do you think that may be the catalyst uh, that that shakes gold free from this uh, repressive paper money regime that is being used to uh, to distort the gold market price? Well, I think the, yeah, and I think the I, I think the BRICs and, and certainly Russia and China are leading this move to to gold. I mean, both both uh, particularly China, but both countries are. Are purchasing a, a, a huge amounts of gold, and I think the Chinese realize that that will become the mainstay of, of currencies in the future. Uh, the whole system, and that's why too that uh, these countries are effectively making war on the dollar. Uh, and uh, one could say that that's why the Ukrainian crisis is there. America mm-hmm. has never liked countries to sort of wage war on the dollar. Right. Saddam Hussein tried it, and he, we know what happened to him. Uh, Gaddafi tried it, and we know what happened to him. Iran tried it, and uh, we haven't had a war, but certainly uh, Iran has been ostracized and, and basically made, uh, effectively you know, trying to bankrupt the country. And now Russia has been the mainstay of the war on the dollar, and we know what's happening there. So, because yeah. uh, you lose that petrodollar status, the United States loses that, it's going to be game over, because yeah. the, the currency, the U.S. dollar, will become effectively worthless. Yeah, what you say reminds me of something someone recently said. They noted that all these countries that are on our bad list are really countries. They're called rogue nations. They're always the, the countries that have decided to uh, to get rid of the dollar to use other currencies. And, uh, you know, the problem with that is that there's a growing number of rogue nations because I think even Germany and Italy and some various countries that are considered our friends uh, have now decided that they will short-circuit the dollar, use their own currency with China. I think there's some agreements, Iran and China, Russia and China, but some of the European countries as well with China. So very fascinating, Ian. Uh, we, we're basically out of time here, unfortunately. So much more to talk to you about. But what I would tell my listeners uh, is go to longwavegroup.com, longwavegroup.com. Avail yourself to Ian's insights. They're free. Uh, you can't do much better than that. And it's no, it's not a matter of you get what you pay for, because in this case, you get a lot more than you pay for. You're paying nothing, but you get... Uh, something that's worth, I think, a very good subscription price. But uh, anyway, that's Ian's business. I want to thank you very much, Ian, for joining me again and, um, and, and updating us on your thoughts. I think they're always, uh, well, like I say, uh, you can laugh at them, you can think Ian's crazy, but the point is that I don't know of anyone else in 1998 that was uh, predicting that the, a new gold bull market of a lifetime was underway. And Ian, you had it right, so congratulations on that. Thanks again for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. 